Perfect. All right, cool. You good to let, for me to let people in? Yep, I think we're good. Okay, um, we are at three o'clock now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our virtual conversation on data sharing in the life sciences. Uh, my name is Melanie Ganey, and I'm the director of the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, as well as a liaison librarian supporting the life science departments at CMU. The Open Science Program has existed since 2018, and we support publicly available, transparent, and reproducible research across disciplines with tools, guidance, training opportunities, and events. And CMU Libraries also provides financial support for open access publishing. As some of you might be aware, uh, the White House declared that 2023 is the year of open science. And in celebration of that, CMU Libraries is hosting a number of events and activities um, to stimulate discussion and awareness of open science this fall. We're excited to have our fourth Open Science Symposium um, being hosted virtually on November 3rd, as well as an in-person mixer event on November 8th um, on campus. So I encourage you to check those out as well. This round table today kicks off our open science programming for the fall and was inspired by conversations that we've had with researchers on the changing policies around data sharing. Um, last year, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy announced that all federal funding agencies will have to update their policies within the next couple of years to require public access of publications and underlying research data with no embargo periods. And life science researchers are some of the first to be directly impacted by changing policies um, in this area of data sharing. In January, the NIH updates policy so that NIH funded researchers have to submit and comply with a detailed data sharing plan for their research data. Oops. And while many researchers in the life sciences do have some experience with data sharing, either from journal policies or the NSF, or simply because it aligns with their values, we do expect that the NIH policy will um, greatly improve uh, public access to research. And it's important to note that many would argue that there are not enough incentives right now for data sharing. So this policy might um, be very impactful um, when you think about that as well. So um, we also acknowledge that the fields within the life sciences might be differently impacted by these policies because these research communities have different um, amounts of existing infrastructure, standards, and research practices around data sharing, um, especially since their um, research and methods become very specialized. So with that in mind, we wanted to invite three CMU faculty that work in different fields of the life sciences. Um, and so I loosely describe this as psychology, neuroscience, and genetics and genomics. Um, and so we're excited to hear perspectives um, from their research communities today. So I'll just start with some introductions. Uh, Janine Dutcher is a senior research scientist in the psychology department and the lab director for the health and human performance lab at Carnegie Mellon. Her research uses multiple methods, including neuroimaging and psychoneuroimmunology to examine how positive interventions and experiences may lead to reductions in threat and stress responding. Joel McManus is an associate professor in the biological sciences and computational biology departments at Carnegie Mellon. The McManus lab studies the genetic and molecular mechanisms of gene regulation with high throughput sequencing and computational methods. And Eric Itchery is an Eberly Family Associate Professor in the Biological Sciences Department and the Neuroscience Institute at Carnegie Mellon. The Itchery Lab studies the functional interactions of the motor circuit that lead to skilled behavior, 
using a combination of behavioral, um, physiological, and computational research methods. Um, and I'll also note that Eric was a collaborator with Anna Wajin and myself when we organized the first Open Science Symposium back in 2018. Um, so thank you, Janine, Joel, and Eric, for joining us to share your perspectives on this important topic of data sharing. I'm also excited to introduce our moderators, Anna Von Gulick and Wajin Wong, who are my former colleagues at CMU Libraries and the co-founders of the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program. Anna is currently at Figshare, where she manages repository projects for US federal agencies and public and private research funders. She also leads Figshare's data curation service. Wajin Wang is the director of programs at the Center of Open Science, where she oversees the development and implementation of training, education, and consulting services to help research communities engage in open and reproducible research practices. Um, thank you, Anand Wajin, for your help with this event and your participation in it, and it's been really fun to work with you again. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues at CMU Libraries, Tom Hughes and Katie Berman, who've helped with the logistics of this event. They are helping with Zoom right now, so really appreciate their help, and thank you to them. So before we dive into the conversation, I just want to note that we are recording, so if you would like to turn off your camera, that would now would be a good time to do so. Um, we will post and share the uh, recording after the event. Uh, we welcome questions from the audience for our panelists. And so if you think of them during the event, just put them in the chat and we will be sure to leave time um, for some of those at the end as well. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, and thank you to the CMU Libraries for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, so I drew the short straw a little bit and I'm going to cover the challenges first and then we'll get to the opportunities um, that increasing, increased data sharing uh, might create um, across these different disciplines. Um, and I want to start off by addressing first the NIH policy. Um, it's a little bit the elephant in the room. I don't want us to spend the hour going over the details of policy compliance. I don't speak for the NIH. Um, however, the new NIH data management and sharing policy is going to be a large driver uh, in these biomedical disciplines um, that will greatly increase data sharing and will hopefully um, make data sharing and data reuse an important practice in these uh, scientific fields. Um, so to make sure we're all on the same page about what the NIH policy states, this is a policy that went into place with new awards beginning January 25 of this year. Um, and it says that all NIH funded research that generates scientific data must submit a data management and sharing plan that will be evaluated on an ongoing basis. And this applies to extramural grants and contracts, as well as actually to intramural research at NIH. Um, and it says that the data needs to be shared regardless of if it supports a publication or not, should be shared as soon as possible, um, at least by the time of a publication. Um, and that while not all data needs to be shared that results from NIH funded projects, broad data sharing is what is encouraged, uh, data that supports replications uh, and null no, no results. And so the goal of these data management and sharing plans is that they should maximize appropriate data sharing uh, and leverage existing uh, data standards and existing repository resources as appropriate. There are, of course, NIH Institute specific uh, policies as well that give more information. If you get funding from NIMH, they have specific um, ideas about what they might look for and program officers. But that's the that's the lay of the land. So it doesn't say all data must be shared. It says data management and sharing must be planned and you should maximize data sharing. So with that um, context out of the way, I want to pose um, a first question to our speakers, um, which is simply to say about the policy, this new NIH policy, what was your reaction? What is the reaction of your colleagues and your research communities? Um, and how would this, how will this impact your work? Um, so where should we start? Eric, do you want to kick us off? Sure. 
I think uh, that you're the one who submitted a data management and sharing plan to NIH under this rule. So I thought maybe we'll start with you and your experience. <laughs> uh, yes, I've I've already uh, undergone that that um, that step, um, and I, I think uh, it's useful. And other organizations like NSF have had something like it for a while. Uh, the the downside is that um to me there there's very little explanation of expectations thus far i think it's because the nih itself doesn't know and it's still feeling things out um but the so the difficulty as a hopeful grantee is that you don't know what the bar is as as you Anna sort of said it's it's quite vague as to what needs to be and what might be and and how to do all the things. Um, as a scientist on the other side who might benefit from this change, which I do think is important, and change rarely happens on its own. Um, th there's all sorts of questions of how do you pay for storage, how long do you need to do it, and what. Uh, issues you have to overcome in terms of just the the discoverability and, and access. If if it's in a file type that I've never heard of, um, or if I can't find it, um, these sort of fair principles can really uh, make or break uh, what the NIH, I think, is rightfully trying to do. But um, we're going to need a lot of growing pains for that. Thanks. Um, Janine, uh, your thoughts, your colleagues' thoughts on the new policy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think generally this is the way psychology has had in some ways a crisis of faith on this. Um, I think this has been a, a big topic um, for a number of years, and there's been um, a lot of discussion about what kind of open science practices should look like for the behavioral sciences. Um, and there are some tricky kind of privacy issues that I think come up in particular when you're dealing with human subject data, um, you know, in terms of identifiable information and, and protected health information and things like that. And I think those issues are going to kind of persist to some extent without clearer guidelines. But I do think that generally the field's been moving in this direction and trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, and I think I want to, you know, to some extent echo what Eric was saying about lack of uh, uh, expectations can be challenging. And I think one of the things that is true is that setting this up as a policy at the funding level and that you have to have a clear plan when before you ever start funding is good because I think one of the things that's really hard is trying to shift practices in the middle of data collection or figure out what to do. We've had issues with IRBs saying that, hey, you didn't tell participants when they signed their consent form that you were going to share their data, even if it's de-identified. And so you can't share that data yet or sensitive issues about, you know, certain mental health uh, kind of conditions and where people want, how they want to share de-identified data there and, and sort of being, um, you know, protecting our participants while also doing good science and reproducible uh, science and making sure that we can share these data more broadly. So I think putting a policy in place is a good step. And I think hopefully it will force the conversation a little bit about how to do this well. Um, and, you know, some of the the barriers that come up and sort of the reactions that I think a lot of um, the, the, you know, more senior faculty in, in behavioral sciences are often really wary of this kind of stuff because it often feels a little like you're giving up your intellectual property. And so trying to figure out how we change the culture in such a way that it it feels collaborative and like people aren't out to get you or they're not trying to prove you wrong. And um, and some of those cultural issues, I think, still are have not fully been addressed. And so I think um, those are some of the immediate reactions that come to mind in terms of how... Um, generally the discipline of psychology has approached this. Um, and I think one of the challenges is also um, how you share multimodal data um, and how that kind of, you know, if we do neuroimaging and we also do, um, you know, blood draws where we're assaying for various inflammatory biomarkers and we're also um, doing anything genetic, I'm sure, you know, Joel will have a much better answer to this, but I think there's, there's some, there's some real challenges with sharing large multimodal data sets and how you do that well. And so um, I think this is a great 
step initially for forcing that conversation and really trying to make sure that researchers have the tools they need and are exploring them because I think a lot of them exist and have not often been pursued. Um, and so I think this is hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this is the direction that the, these conversations go and, uh, you know, addressing both the, the logistical barriers and as well the cultural barriers. Yeah, great. A lot more, a lot more we're going to dive into there. Um, <laughs> Joel, um, a first reaction from you. Oh, yeah. So um, I guess in my field that genetics and genomics, uh, a large segment of the data have been shared for the last 10 or 15 years because of the problem arose earlier on with this, um, that very large data sets of sequences of DNA were being generated. And uh, it was acknowledged at the time that we didn't really even have the tools to completely properly uh, analyze the data and understand them. So there's, there was a framework put in place um, quite a long time ago to store data and share it publicly um, through the NCBI, um, which the US government funds and supports. Uh, but there are other types of data that have not really been accessible to people. And the NCBI database is um, very difficult to navigate uh, because now there are hundreds of thousands of experiments recorded there. Um, and so there are questions of, you know, how long is it really necessary to do that? How useful is it? How to access the data? Um, and there are many other kinds of data that are not currently shared um, that I think the new policy should help uh, encourage people to share those kinds of, of data that are not currently reported. Sometimes things are reported in ratios and the, the raw data are never reported. Um, and so I think overall, this is a very positive thing. Um, there aren't that many guidelines as to how to do it, uh, but I think over time that should get resolved. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to hear from other fields because uh, you, you understand that data types are, are extremely broad and varied. Um, and there may be very different reactions and cultures to those things. But at least in genetics and genomics, the, there's been a, a culture from the explosion of this the last 15 or 20 years of trying to share the very uh, most raw forms of the data um, so that other people can actually go back and use them for whatever purpose uh, they find, including you know proving you wrong, which I think is probably what as scientists, one of the main things that we we should actually encourage instead of being scared of. So this is the, one of the challenges in, in scientific research is that you know for our own egos and and self uh, self worth, we want to believe that we're always right. But the whole point of science is that we keep proving older things wrong, um, and that's often how we make the most progress. So. I think that that's an important part of, of maintaining and sharing data, though it is also kind of a disconcerting one on a personal level, you know, worrying about what people might find. Um, so those are all things that, that need to be navigated. And I think it's a very positive step that the funding agencies are starting to require this. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I think this is a, hopefully we'll really shift the culture uh, a little, a little faster than it was already shifting in some fields. Um, but genomics is certainly a good one to look to. Um, so my next question, I wanted to dive into something that each of you touched on, on partly, which was in your disciplines, um, how prepared is your discipline to handle uh, widespread data sharing? Um, and what are the gaps that exist? Uh, different disciplines are more or less mature in this area in terms of standards, uh, training for their uh, trainees uh, in data management, sharing practices, common practices, uh, formats, and documentation to make data reusable, uh, and also discipline-specific repository resources. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, Joel, you touched on this in terms of the sophistication that's already happened in genomics, um, but maybe we'll circle back to you to, to keep that thread going. What are the what are the gaps that still exist and, and where do you think more maturity uh, needs to come? Sure. So um, yeah, so in genomics, 
now there are these public data sites where you can deposit data, but the problem is really in analyzing the data again. Um, if you have to download and copy it, and it's very slow to do these things. So there are efforts being made to try to link it to computational resources in the cloud so people can use data more easily and reanalyze data without a lot of you know, network transfer. Um, and I think that's one area that could really use a lot of development is you know, having uh, distributed analysis platforms that are available and, and easily accessible uh, to researchers. Um, another issue with this amount of data has just been cataloging it and being able to find what you want to work on. Um, and having the correct metadata for for experiments is extremely important so people can know, well, you know, maybe your experiment doesn't match what was published because there's some environmental difference or there's some uh, difference in how the experiments were performed. And in order to know that, you really have to have very detailed metadata. Um, some of the other challenges as we go forward, there are new data types that really no one has figured out exactly what to do with. Um, so traditionally, these have just been sequence data from a sing single sample. Um, and now the sequence data are, are being converged with imaging data in something called spatial transcriptomics and sort of a frontier of uh, new new techniques and approaches to ex examine the expression of genes in different locations in in biological tissues, and that creates you know an order of magnitude larger sizes in files, and there really aren't well appreciated or standardized file formats, and these are all things that um, that complicate the issue of sharing data. I think that you know Eric alluded to also with file formats and things, so. There are a lot of challenges be as, as technology improves and data sets change, the types of data change to kind of uh, creating uniform ways to store and, and process and access data. I think those are the, the kind of the bigger challenges going forward. Yeah, love the shout out to the metadata, high quality metadata. <laughs> um, uh, Janine or, or Eric, one of you wanna pick up with your discipline? Next. I'd, I'd jump on the metadata thing, which immediately came to mind. It is, um, as someone pointed out, a, a cultural thing. A lot of times it's not well recorded, but also can be a huge cost. In order to properly record the metadata, you need to train whoever's recording it to, to record it appropriately, and they have to take the time to do it. Uh, and currently, not to get back to the elephant in the room, but uh, currently the, there is no allowances there for either training of, of students or that amount of time to be invested in it uh, or, or the potentially money for either departmental or on a per lab basis, uh, some form of software technician or something of the like that would be trained and, and that would be their sort of uh, job to make sure it was all done and all done well. Um, so I think that that's a, a big thing in neuroscience and neurophysiology. We have had a, a sort of standard that has existed called Neurodata Without Borders. Um, everyone knows about it. Very few people participate. That may happen in the future, um, but uh, I think that's uh, I think metadata and just the resources to store, our lab generates three terabytes of data a day. That's too big for Figshare. Figshare is fantastic. But um, yeah, that that's a, a hurdle that uh, maybe the NIH will come up with like they have with proteomics and genomics, but we'll see. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in psychology, maybe we have a lot of people fill out a lot of surveys or there's behavioral experiments. So the um, the actual data points may be very few. Um, and so sharing the, those kind of data don't seem to be a particularly challenging thing. There's all kinds of different types of repositories. There's no consistency in what people use and how they format those things. But I think that is relatively something 
um, straightforward that could happen. Um, I do think that a lot of journals have for uh, a number of years required data sharing in, in some capacity in order to um, publish there. And if you've ever downloaded those uh, supplemental materials or those pieces of data, it's horrible because there's genuinely no consistency whatsoever. And sometimes I don't even know what I'm looking at. Some of it's probably a metadata problem, but some of it is also just so many labs have very specific idiosyncratic ways that they label data and that they they sort of process their data. Um, and one of the problems at the level of um, psychology also is how raw um, do you want like item specific numbers? Do you want that what they typed if it was ever on paper, which hopefully isn't anymore, but there are some data sets where people are still using paper or if there's something that a participant actually has to physically do, how do you translate that? Is it just reaction time? You could just share the reaction time. Um, is that useful to people? And um, and so many of the kind of things that happen in psychology experiments are often the methods are really the essential piece to result in that data. And so how you share a data set um, really needs to be structured within the methods used to collect those data. Um, and I think that's that's one big challenge. Um, similarly with neuroimaging data, just fMRI, for example, the task specific design matrices and how you share all of that really influences what's usable from um, the sort of data sharing from uh, actual scans. And so I think um, there's some challenges there. I think when you have a data set that most of the data I work with is multimodal, right? We'll have behavioral uh, outcomes, we'll have survey outcomes, we'll have neuroimaging outcomes, we'll have neuroinflammatory markers, whatever's going on and sharing those and, and some sort of way that is useful when the formatting for each type of data might be um, a little bit different can be one challenge that I think there's not, uh, you know, every lab does things so differently that there's not really a consistent pattern. And that for me, literally in my data is one of the challenges. And we have one data set where we used a, a, an app on a smartphone to collect a lot of passive sensing data. And it's huge. It was a whole semester, hundreds of participants. And sometimes those measurements were happening every, you know, 15 seconds or whatever it is. There's location data every 10 minutes. Um, and having data like that is, you know, I'm sure it is not three terabytes a day, so I don't know what is going on over in the HR lab, but uh, there is definitely, there's definitely a lot of data and trying to figure out how to share that in a way that's useful to people is, is one thing. I think what has happened is a lot of people have been forced to share data. And so they're like, fine, you get ever, whatever format I have it in, and I'm not going to do any work to share that uh, in a way that's reusable for anyone. And I think that's one of those cultural problems that it, um, I think comes up people feel like they don't want to get scooped or they don't want to share too much of their data um, before they get the chance to publish on it. So why would they format it in a way that makes it easy for anyone? And so I think there's some of these like cultural things that come again back into the uh, fray that influence what barriers there are. But I still think about just like a lack of consistency, but also just how raw and what format is reusable. And I think that that's a nice term that you brought up on is the, the reusability of these these data is, is key. And I don't think there's um, a good answer, at least in the behavioral sciences yet. You feel like there's standards and people are intentionally not adopting them because of effort or that they are not applicable to enough use cases? I like, think they're thinking of bids and, thing, and open neuro and things like that but they're yeah. not that widely adopted. And I think there's so many lab specific things. Like if you're working for a PI who doesn't know about or doesn't care that deeply about this, they're not gonna teach you. You might learn from a postdoc, you might hear about it. Like, you know, I, I just stepped into a role to be the co-director of the Bridge Neuroimaging Center and we are supporting BIDS and other sort of neuroimaging um, sharing practices. But even if that is available to you, how do you do it? You know, there's there's a learning curve. And I think um, if that is not a big piece of your training as a graduate student, um, you miss that, then it becomes super laborious in the, in the long run to be able to try and figure out how to adapt your protocols to be able to share in ways. So I think some of it is um, disingenuous, but I'd say a lot of it is just a learning curve. Um, and that has that has gotten in the way of some of the I, you know, I tried to go back to old data to make it more bids friendly. And that took 
over a year to get like scripts and everything written by people who are experts in writing these scripts to get it to a position where I could make it um, uh, sort of serve the bids format. So I think there's, there's, there are standards and practices, but getting trained in them is still a little bit the wild west. And it is so PI specific that um, I think that hopefully something like this, where if it at a funding level, because journals, if you sent them a file, they'd go, okay. <laughs> sure. So, so planning this in advance and sort of saying to NIH, this is how we're going to do it, um, I think helps kind of structure um, the change that would support this. Again, there are, there are financial issues that come up. Um, and I think that's maybe something NIH could um, put, you know, tag some money for supporting these things in these grants. But um, that that training piece is, is a key one that I, I see being a problem here. Yeah. And I should define our terms, brain, BIDS being the brain imaging data standard for uh, neuroimaging, for, for MRI data, although it extends to many modalities now in, in EEG and, and MEG and stuff as well. Um, great. So I'm going to ask one more challenges question, which we were just getting to there with Janine, which is um, what support would you need and, and where might this support come from to encourage uh, broader adoption of best practices for data management and sharing? Might support come from a department or college or institutional library level to kind of bring it back to the CMU libraries? Uh, what some more support might come from your funder? Uh, in the case of NIH, would that be financial support or would that be resources or best practices dictated from their side? Um, so whoever wants to jump in first, I'll leave the floor open. I think in a lot of ways, we we maybe not the sources, but identified them. Uh, some form of training, which uh, maybe is best coming from an entity like the library, um, and just thinking about, and to get jargon out of the way, I, I brought up FAIR principles before, but that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which are terms we've already used. Um, but uh, yeah, I think one other one would be storage, which I mentioned Figshare, Pittsburgh Supercomputing has some storage, um, or, and there's other things there. Um, but unfortunately, the the first one, findable, um, that almost has to come from a big entity that's nationwide or even international. Um, but certainly in terms of getting it there, uh, that's probably best done at, at a local level. Yeah, there's this broader ecosystem of, of resources and infrastructure underpinning this whole thing, which is which is what my day to day is about, a lot is a lot of repositories working together with the people that create data set search and um, yeah, but there's the there's the local infrastructure as well, especially for storage, um, which is costly. Uh, Joel, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I was going to agree with those needs for for storage. Um, also, we have. It can it can take quite a while to submit data to be shared. Um, even with this framework we have now with NCBI and the, the several databases that they have, a sequence uh, read archive is called SRA. Um, for every genomics paper where we produce new data, it can take us an afternoon or a day of our time to submit those data, and and it's it's something that you have to pay a lot of attention to during the process. It's not. It's not like uh, dragging a file into a you know Google Drive to share. It's a uh, it's a very long and kind of tedious thing. If you take it seriously and and fill out the metadata properly, it can take a lot of your time to do. Especially if you have dozens of samples and things. It's very so you know having support for that sort of thing would be really uh, could be really great. Um, currently, it's just something that you know eats up your afternoon or your day or your students' couple of days, depending on how familiar they are with it. Um, and I think more support in accessing and reusing data would be really great. So one thing that that comes to mind with this is that I don't I'm not sure how well we train our our undergraduates and our graduate students on how to find these things. Um, so this is part of the 
the challenge with so much information being accessible and available, uh, if, if it's not used, it's not really doing anything. It's just you know stored being stored on a compute server someplace. Um, so getting access to the data and and finding ways, teaching people how to access the data and what to do with it, I think is important. It also goes into um, I think faculty courses. Uh, a lot of graduate courses for PhD students are reading papers and discussing them. And I doubt many people at all will say, let's discuss the supplemental tables. Now, what did you guys think? Could you understand what each column meant the way it was described? You know, so I think that we as faculty are not really supporting our students to learn how to responsibly uh, package data to be shared and to access data for sharing. So I think you know there's not there hasn't been a great culture of that. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of things that we will probably need to do better in a cultural sense in science than just to post it online and say okay we you know we're done because I think all, the other side of what's going on is there are probably huge numbers of repeat experiments that are not necessary, but are done just because we don't know how to find the answer that's already been published, that's out there. Um, so, so I think all of those things would help support uh, scientists in, in sharing data and accessing it in the future. Yeah, Janine? The training thing seems like a key one um, and getting people um, on board with uh, some sort of structure that serves them. I think one of the things that, you know, I've noticed even when I am eager to figure out how to share data well, I am faced with a multitude of options, um, hard to assess what the best strategy is. Um, and again, I think there's like a cultural, I, I hate to bring it up, but I am the psychologist in the room, so okay. <laughs> There is a cultural problem in in sort of like if you are communicating with a PI who is less enthusiastic about open science practices um, or who's enthusiastic but has done none of it, they're not really going to be um, as helpful in helping you kind of parse what is necessary and, and what is helpful for future people. And I think, you know, sometimes we learn best by seeing what other people do. So to, to Joel's comment about um, structuring this in a course even just downloading a data set and being able to figure out what they did well and didn't do well and and sort of trying to learn from what exists out there and and trying to improve some of those standards um, I think could be an important learning opportunity and also a way to um, make sure that we're getting data to people that they can use um, which I feel I still think is is a big problem at least in in psychology data um, and you know, the how long we store it question that I think Eric brought up earlier still is bouncing around in my brain a little bit because, you know, medical records you store for seven years or whatever it is. And then the doctor's office, you know, back in the day could shred that. <laughs> Clearly, that's not what we want to do with any of our scientific data. But, um, you know, there is that file drawer problem where if it was null results and it wasn't that interesting, no one cares. That just goes out into the ether and something else comes up later. And actually, that would have been really helpful to learn about or to know about or whatever. And so there's also kind of an incentivizing problem where you're not going to publish those data. Maybe they can't get published. And so then they're not linked to something that then tells people that those data exist. And you just get into this position of not knowing what is out there and how to even use it, even if it were. And I think it just, it feels a little bit like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of challenges, but the, the training one seems to kind of fit a lot of this. Like if we did had some consistency and could train people in consistent practices, hopefully that would be easier to, um, to find the, the important um, data sets. Yeah. I think that's great. And I think that rolls right into the uh, the opportunities and the incentives. So I'll hand it over to Hua Jin. Awesome. Uh, um, thanks, Anna. Uh, and thanks for uh, all the great discussions. There's just really rich discussions. I hear a lot of, you know, the uh, issues with like uh, the, the technicalities, the technical difficult barriers for data sharing, the 
uh, different types of data, the size of the data, and also um, uh, the cost of uh, data sharing and the student training. And also, uh, uh, Janine, you brought up the, the other facet, right? The culture, the research culture, the culture change is an important piece. Uh, so yeah, that's a natural segue to talk about the potential uh, opportunities and changes that might be happening. Um, here, I think I want to dig a little deeper on the cultural change of things and uh, just kind of, uh, do you think that we are going, we're heading to the direction where, um, so these uh, these policy changes are kind of uh, heading one step towards the right direction, right? Um, but do you think practically in the near future, are we going to go to, uh, get to a place where uh, the sharing data and the research outputs are going to be a um, viewed as a, a standard instead of a burden, extra work, um, and also uh, with um, uh, and also with the activities thinking about how we evaluate research, right? With whether it's going to be viewed as an important professional accomplishment as opposed to just something like a box that I check. Um, so maybe you, uh, Janine, do you want to take the first uh, step? Sure. So I think um, the currency of academia is publications and grants. Um, and so having some, uh, I don't, you know, those data sharing is not necessarily rewarded. Um, and so having policies at these journals and at these funding agencies that supports data sharing, I think will hopefully make it um, more standard and, and I think a, a practice that then becomes part of how you do science. Um, that said, I think the initial kind of uh, perception is going to be that you're being forced to do it. Um, and so I think that is, you know, maybe a little bit of a cultural barrier. And I think um, you, it'll feel a little bit like there's not you know, there's not great incentives. Some journals um, I know of in, in my field have been giving papers badges when they um, share data in appropriate ways. And it's, it feels a little bit like a sticker chart, but maybe that's, maybe that's helpful for some people. And maybe that's enough of an incentive to sort of um, say like, Hey, we have, we have a bunch of, uh, you know, data sharing stickers on our sticker chart, um, gold star for the, for the, for the year. But, but I do think that there's some level um, within the institutions that can kind of support data sharing and data science as well. Um, you know, how does your um, tenure review, your annual review, how do they see um, open science practices and are those incentivized and rewarded and um, I think that those are the kinds of things that will make it much easier for it to be a standard practice. Um, and uh, that said, I just a small little asterisk on um, grants and publications being the currency in academia too, because I think that can cause a lot of uh, weird um, behaviors in terms of splitting and splicing data, um, in terms of uh, you know quality of publications and things like that. So there may be a, a broader cultural shift that this kind of accompanies as well about how we how we incentivize good science, not just productive, plentiful science. <laughs> Joel or Eric, would you like to chime in? Maybe maybe I could add a little bit. So yeah, I agree that the a main problem is that there isn't a lot of incentive and it's sort of a disincentive because we have limited amount of time and we we don't get uh, paid in any way right now. We don't get any uh, any immediate gratitude or benefit for sharing things properly. Um, so I think actually, you know, one of the currencies of science, we all have uh, for better or worse, like uh, there's a, a number called an H index and an I index that that tracks how many times our publications are cited by other people. Uh, maybe we need a data index instead. How many times our, our data sets are downloaded and used or appear and referenced in, in journals as being used for other people's work? Um, you know, maybe keeping score of that in addition to how many times our work is cited would be good because oftentimes papers are cited just in passing saying, oh, this person showed X, Y, Z. And other times someone will actually cite the paper because they use the data. 
So I think that's something that might be able, you know, we might be able to automate as a community to go through publications and pull out when when papers are actually used for their data and, you know, actually record that and give people credit for it. Um, I think actually also training people to use public data would increase people's value of sharing their own public data. So if you're commonly downloading public data sets and using them for your own research, then suddenly you feel more compelled and to actually go back and, and repay that instead of paying it forward to other people saying, oh, I've, I've benefited from this, so I want to make sure I continue to do this. So I think the training and, and increased use of public data would actually also incentivize people to want to, to uh, deposit their data in usable ways. In in this discussion, I've actually kind of thought about some of the infrastructure that already exists. I have two major grants that, that are specifically designed to put me together with someone who's more computationally minded. And so for every biological experiment I do, in theory, I get another paper or two cited in which I've given that data to someone else and they've found out things that, that I either can't or don't have bandwidth to do. And so there's actual mechanisms for that. Um, and so I, this sidesteps many of the problems that we've been discussing, but in some ways that very purposeful and, and planned out mechanism for sharing may be more useful and of the of the remaining cases, um, it, it may be valuable to make a distinction between um, the probably useful and the potentially useful. If it is a, a very small niche study, maybe this is much ado about nothing. There's always the, you know, who knows, it might be big someday or sa save someone an experiment. Um, but uh, maybe instead uh, of everyone must save all of their data and have it all accessible and, and pray that people get metadata, um, instead either turn it into a supplement in which people, you know, if you're going to be generating large data volumes that many people in the community might be, might enjoy using, you you have that as a supplement or or, a, or an extra on your grant, um, rather than assuming that all data are equally usable, and that might also help with findability as well uh, by just not flooding the marketplace. Um, random thoughts, but um, yeah, there there is some infrastructure already there, but it's um, it it's very small and and personal rather than institutional. Funders take notes. Yeah, the intentionality of that, because I think it fits with the grant cycle, right? That you're designing a study with the purpose of sharing the data in a way that's reusable, right? And I can think of large scale neuroimaging studies that are designed like this from the beginning, right? To generate very large data sets designed to be reused and not even by neuroscientists, but also by computer scientists, right? So that's the data sharing influencing the science. Right. Yeah. Then the, yeah. the attention, the intention helps mm -hmm. focus the attention in getting everything in line. And in those cases, oftentimes there is money allocated and, and accepted that resources will be allocated towards that goal in addition to the purely scientific uh, exploration enterprise. Yeah, that's great. So a um, lot of these uh, culture discussions sounds like we're kind of um, landed on the incent incentive piece, right? So like with talked about uh, intensive for like uh, for like faculty promotion and for grants um for recognition and for paying community back right and so what uh so with all these um how with all these uh, um um 
so how what, from here to moving on to the like being open uh, data sharing as viewed as a professional accomplishment, how do you think we should evaluate, give you credit for all these, right? And kind of measure the impact so that we can, this is so that it becomes part, part of excellence, excellence instead of um, just something we ought to do for the greater good. Yeah, so I think there should be some kind of scoring system. I mean, that that's just one proposal for for kind of keeping track of this so that people actually know how often some PI's work has been used before, whether her lab has generated a huge amount of data that is used over and over again. I mean, if that's the case, then it would be nice to be able to quantify that. Um, and that that might drive as an incentive that you know people can brag about that a little bit and go see on their Google Scholar page not just their H index but their D index you know if you want whatever you want to call it um, and see that grow and and feel kind of inspired by seeing other people who have that as well. And Janine or Eric, do you have something to add? Um. <laughs> less optimistic about another measure that all of us will claim they don't want to use like impact factor. Um, but um, yeah, journalists have tried and they don't have the infrastructure to do it. Well, to various extents, NIH may have it, but um, maybe this brute force will, will lead to small and meaningful changes. But um... I do think uh, there's a lot of, you know, discussion about publications and grants being the the primary way that you get um, the incentives. Um, and there's a lot of kind of hidden work. I mean, even just reviewing papers seems it seems unbelievable to anyone outside of academia that you don't get paid for that and that you just have to do it and that there's recommendations that you're supposed to review like two to three papers per paper, you you know, some, you know, there's numbers and there's no incentive for that. And honestly, if you do that, sometimes you can't do papers or grants <laughs> because you are spending that time doing that. And so I think, um, you know, all that hidden work is, this starts to feel like this is part of that hidden work, right? That is part of that, um, that extra labor that gets tasked to someone and, someone junior and someone female and someone, you know, all somehow this all gets down and it's, there's all kinds of inequalities that come up. And so I think it's kind of an important thing to think about how that, like who leads that, um, maybe at the level of the department, they need to sort of incentivize by, you know, encouraging and setting things up and funding and those incentives to make it less difficult or less challenging. Maybe there needs to be sort of, you know, department like personnel that actually can support you. I think the libraries have been trying to do this. I don't think that everyone even knows what kind of capabilities the libraries have. Um, and honestly, I'm I'm learning about it now, which is probably how everyone, how I got invited to this is because I've been talking to um, different librarians about the, the problems that we have in this. And so I think, um, you know, those kinds of supports are maybe available and maybe not um, well known, um, but also I think would be a really helpful way to make it feel like it is not quite as much the hidden work and instead is um, incentivized by making it easier. You know, sometimes it's not about necessarily uh, rewarding it per se, but making it less um, challenging logistically too. That's, that's great. That's a great point. Just kind of um, make it easy and rewarding at the same time. Yeah. Um, so uh, for the sake of time, I guess we're um, five minutes left. I want to save some uh, time for uh, the audience questions too. Um, so I'll pass it back to Melanie. Um, great, thank you. And I think this question of who leads this work actually segues mm -hmm. into our question who is from Cheryl Tolmer, who's also in the biological sciences department at CMU. Um, and she says, yes, having standards provided by a guiding body would help to do better science because all metadata would be recorded and proper controls performed. Who should do this? 
If publications are to remain the measure of productivity, then it should fall to the journals or at least in collaboration with the funding agencies. We are shifting from paper recording of protocols to electronic and therefore researchers need to detail how all of the data was collected, processed and used. So I think this is the question of who, who leads in creating the standards. Is that the funding agencies or the journals involved? And Cheryl, also feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to elaborate on that point. <clears throat> Not, not so much. I think it's, I, I don't think we know, right? It's it's kind of, um, it's just up in the air. I do feel Carnegie Mellon can make, have an impact because of the strength of the computer science department. And people look to Carnegie Mellon as an example for a lot of this. So if, you know, faculty need to be supported somehow, um, how that is, I don't, I guess I'm not sure. I, I believe that if there if if someone would say you know you need this and this and this on your data people would comply but you're not just going to make stuff up because of a nebulous plan about data sharing right if you would all comply if you were given um a mandate to do that um so I feel like NIH is expecting people to just come up with you know, what they're going to do. And, and I really think they should give a little bit more um, or else give a whole pile of money to get people to do it. I just read something about ARPA-H putting some money into a, a data structure grant. So maybe maybe that's a faster way to do it than through NIH. Um, so we'll see. I, I will put a little plug in for the Cloud Lab because all of this data is collected there. <laughs> every item, you know, right down to the temperature of the room when the experiment was performed, but it's only, you know, good for certain kinds of experiments. So, um, but that idea of, of having every piece of um, the environment and the protocol collected is interesting. I think one really key thing that comes up, NIH funds a wide range of disciplines. Um, and there are some discipline specific issues that would come up. And if you wanted to have some sort of standardized protocol, trying to imagine a clinical mental health study paralleling a study uh, on, you know, frankly, mostly any <laughs> kind of NIH related thing is challenging. And I think that is probably why nothing has happened thus far, um, is that there's some idiosyncrasies that are going to be hard to contend with. But I do think that there's a way to do pieces of that, right? Like there's a way to kind of have some guiding principles and themes um, and then implementation that matches the discipline specific needs. And, and um, you know, I don't imagine that that is going to be an easy feat and it's going to probably require some some time but i do think that that is a challenge that has made this hard and then has made it really hard for interdisciplinary researchers like myself i i have a lot of trouble knowing because you know one journal might have some policies that another journal doesn't and i publish in both of them regularly so which one am i going to use as the kind of overarching guidelines for my lab i don't know so um, great, thank you. And I think that actually, um, you know, that point you made about how the NIH is, you know, involves many different disciplines. And that was, you know, I think the original idea behind this panel was, you know, to hear from people in these different parts of the NIH funded research ecosystem. And I know I learned a lot about um, what that looks like in genomics and psychology. I'm more familiar with neuroscience because my own background, but um, I just want to thank all of you for, there was so many interesting insights shared today. Um, and I will say um, in just the last minute, um, Janine alluded to this. I think CMU Libraries does do a lot of work to support open science. Um, it's always a bit challenging to get that word out to everyone on campus. Um, so I do encourage people, um, to check out our resources, get in touch with us. Um, we're constantly, um, creating new types of services and support around this type of work, which is evolving pretty rapidly now. Um, so again, a huge thank you to our panelists, our moderators, um, and my colleagues who are behind the scenes, 
um, helping out. And I will say that um, a lot of the themes you touched upon today, we will be talking about at the Open Science Symposium on November 3rd as well. We have a whole panel um, dedicated to this issue of promotion and tenure. So um, if you are in the audience and you wanted to hear more about any of this, I encourage you to sign up for our virtual symposium um, as well. So um, with that, uh, thank you so much for attending and we will be sending out the recording soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.